Okay. Let's let's get started. So I um I just think it'd be a good idea today given what happened in Pittsburgh on Saturday and given the subject of today's class do we take a um, have a moment of silence Just out of respect. So what I want to do today is talk about some things that I think it's, you know, it's really, it's unfortunate that um, the way I like to run the class is kind of stay current or stay up with current events and kind of dress things as they come along. And uh, it's just really can be a a bit disheartening when I find myself steering into violence so often. And, uh, but I want to take today and frame some things because in the context of kind of where where we're at historically and where we've been and where we're going. I just think it'd be really helpful to frame a few things for you all. So this is uh, one of the flyers from the rally in Charlottesville that was organized by people in the, we call it the alt-right, the the white nationalist movement. And what I, so you remember this was just a little over a year ago, and what really prompted this, there were a number of things that prompted this rally, but one, of course, was that um, the kind of tearing down of Confederate statues in the South and um, any number of, of other issues. Um, the rise, I think, of kind of a new politics or perceived new politics, but, um, but in any event, uh, quite a number of people were very emboldened to come out and more than really has happened in a long time. And what I want you to notice on this, um, first off, the Daily Storm, but I want you to notice that. This is not a hooded figure of a KKK member. And what you see on this flyer, the main flyer of this rally, is the Star of David. And I'm going to talk about that. I want to frame that a little bit. And here are some images from that. You know, here you have the Confederate flag because, of course... You know, that's part of what drew some people together. But, you know, a very large number of people turned out um, and were holding, here's another flag like this over there and the swastika and, and, you know, doing the the Nazi salute. You know, just imagining that, like just doing that, right? So, you know, I'm going to frame some of this for you today about the implications. But, you know, when I see that, I'm, I'm just aghast that a human being could, could do that at all in, in, you know, after the 20th century. And so here's, you know, another Nazi flag and this young guy carrying that. And, you know, this is, uh, the, you know, from the, 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 the Daily the Stormer from their website. I just kind of grabbed it to, because, you know, the, the merchandise may vary from time to time, but the merchant's always the same. And, of course, that's the character of a, of a Jewish person. And these are all flags. These are all neo-Nazi fascist flags. This is one actually from... Someone had this at the alt-right. That's actually from South Africa, um, the top one. And so, you know, you see this kind of neo-Nazi fascist movement all over the world. And... Uh, 
you know, in, many, in countries in, in Europe, in many countries, it's even illegal to have that flag. It was illegal. I gave a talk in St. Petersburg earlier this year, and just my, my wife and I, and just as part of our slideshow presentation, we had a swastika up. We showed this photo, actually, and th the students at the university were really aghast. They said, look, it's illegal for you to even show that photo. And so, you know, when we got, when we finished, uh, with the presentation, we, have to, we had to delete it from the machine completely, right? And so, you know, it's... Uh, and here are two words, and I, I want to say a few things and contextualize these. Um, so for white nationalists, um, white genocide is the key word. And for white nationalists, Jews are most... Are, White nationalists are most afraid of Jews. So the hate, the vitriolic hate goes out more against Jews than anybody else. So they also hate blacks and Hispanics and Native Americans, any indigenous people, Asians. doesn't really matter at that level. But the deepest hate is against Jews. And the reason for that is these other groups, they're not really that dangerous because white people a purified white people, a strong white people that have not been weakened by any policies anywhere, a strong white people can handle black people, Hispanic people, Asian people. It's not really a threat. White people can overpower them, but Jews are smart, according to the white nationalists. Jews, which are sometimes seen as white, but most often not, because it's kind of difficult, right? Because many Jewish people identify as white, and so, but for these folks, but they're not pure white people. So for the white nationalists, Jews are the most scary, because they're identified as, historically speaking, just like that image, as being crafty, and cunning, and cunning, and like, really have this long-term plan to take over the world. And, th and I'm going to talk about how far back this goes. But the idea is that Jewish people have a long-term plan to take over wor the world. And according to the white nationalists, the key plan in the United States is to support multiculturalism. So the more you can weaken the bloodline, the more you can weaken white people, and in particular white people's resolve, to have a nation that is run by white people, the fittest of all people, the smartest of all people, the purest of all people, the more you can have a nation where that gets weakened, then who's going to win? According to these folks, Jewish people. Because Jewish people are just playing this big chess game. So let's bring multiculturalism to the United States and let's let all of these black and brown people weaken things, and then we'll just keep operating behind the scenes. This is always, it's always the hidden, unseen threat, just like this image here. Behind, the merchandise may vary, but the merchant's always the same. And behind him are all of these things. The open border, gender bending, whatever it is. So the issue becomes, this is the ideology. And notice this white nationalism. It's not white supremacy. That has changed in the past 20 years. The folks on the extreme right don't talk about white supremacy. They talk about white nationalism. Because white nationalism is a way to get a foothold. So think about much of the language of somebody like Donald Trump talking about the the caravan coming up from Mexico. And think about how that's discussed. And think about the words that are used, that he uses, and others are using to describe them. They're going to come up here. They're invading. These are the invaders coming. This is like a, it's like a, a disease that's coming to weaken the United States. This is the thinking of the white nationalists. So while Trump, is not in any way a white nationalist. He doesn't identify with them, and it's really wrong. If you're, if you're making that identification, I think you're doing a deep disservice because I, that's not what's going on here. But he's playing into the fold of this so that 
white nationalism. Lots of people, very few people can get on board with the idea that white people are biologically superior. But lots of people can get on board that says all those people invading this country, coming up from down south, the poor people, the criminals, the one after another, those people, that's actually a threat to our way of life. That's not racist. A threat to our way of life in the minds of many, many people. Millions and millions of Americans. Now, for those millions of Americans then to turn around and identify down here as white nationalists, that's a different story. That takes more. But the question becomes, how much more? How much more? And so, where did this idea of Jewish people come from? Look, first off, It's all white genocide. That is the buzzword. That is what gets these white nationalists going. That's what gets their blood going. White genocide. Because multiculturalism is essentially the genocidal practice of aimed at white people. We will exterminate whiteness as it is. The greatest fear. And in many ways, what we're looking at right now is the last stand. For many of these folks, this is the last stand right now these days. So this guy, so Robert Bowers is the guy that committed the criminal acts that murdered all of the Jewish people in the synagogue. This was one of his last tweets. The filthy, or uh, it was his last post on Gab. The filthy, evil Jews are bringing the filthy, evil Muslims into the country. Because he's listening to the rhetoric or the ideas of people in the administration saying inside of this group of people coming from Mexico are Muslims and members of ISIS and whatever, who knows what. The filthy evil Jews are bringing the filthy evil Muslims into the country. This is his very last tweet right here. Hyas likes to bring invaders. And by the way, in Hyas is Hebrew, the Hebrew immigrant, is it immigrant aid society, immigration aid society. Hyas likes to bring invaders in that kill our people. I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics, I'm going in. That's the last thing he posted before he committed the killings. So here's a guy who lives inside of white supremacist thinking, who envisions what's happening right now as the last stand. Jewish people, the greatest threat. And so, of course, Jewish people are going to be the primary target. And... The Hebrew Immigration Assistance, what that is, that's an organization that started in the 19th century to assist Jews who were persecuted in the pogroms, but now has expanded out. And and it was being celebrated on that day. The guy knew this is like all comes together. 1488 is what he had tattooed on his arm. In 1488, 14 is a, you see this a lot, it is 14 words, and it represents a single statement that is adopted by everybody in the white nationalist movement. And it means literally, we must secure the existence of our people and the future of white children. 88 stands for the eighth letter of the alphabet two times, HH, as in Heil Hitler. So you see these two things going together all the time. So this guy represents one of these extremist people who sees this as the last stand. And so the question becomes, where did it come from? Where does this ideology come from? And here, look at, of course we're going to see a rise. 
because something's been unleashed in the United States. 2016, here are the number of anti-Semitic incidents. Here we are in 2017, and in 2018, I'm sure it's going to be higher. So where does this come from? The hatred of Jewish people. You know, I was in the Amazon rainforest one time, and I, I got in a boat in this little town. First off, I took a truck way into the forest as far as I could go. I got to the end of the line. I got in a boat and I took a ride up. It was about four or five hours, the Rio Napo. And I get out of the boat and I walk through the jungle and I arrive at this community where I was going. This is 25 years ago. I arrive at the community. I sit down. We start talking and they say, what's your name? And I say, Samuel. And somebody says, are you Jewish? And I said, no. And their response was, gracias a Dios. Thank God. And I thought, how do you even, you're living in the middle of the rainforest. You were like far away. There's nothing here except all of the materials from the forest that they used to make their homes and make all the things around them. And still, there's anti-Semitism. So the question is, where does that come from? And that's what I want to talk about today. But I first want to start out by talking about what it means to be Jewish. What it means to be... First off, how many of you are Jewish in here, identify as Jewish? Raise your hands. It's a lot of people. Wait, actually, can you stand up? I want to see better, actually. Can you just stand up? I want to see. Yeah. It's a lot of people. So, okay, thanks. So what's it mean to be Jewish? And what I need, I need two volunteers who haven't spoken before, who just can come down and just say, I don't know, just tell us something about being Jewish. There's one, a woman, I need a guy. Is there, I need a guy, a Jewish man. Just come down. You're just going to, we're just going to take like five minutes. No, hang on one sec. I need a guy. Dude, here, come down. Who else? Bro. Wait, hang on. Did you, you spoke before though, right? All right, come on, man. Here, come on over here. Have a seat. You can sit on the table if you want. What's your name? Brittany. Brittany. All right. Brittany. Bro. Mm-hmm. What's your name? Noah. Noah? Yeah. No. No. Noah. Noah. All right, man. Brittany. Noah. So, what's it mean to be Jewish? Who wants to start? Like, what? Let me just say, what do you, what do you where are you from? Where you're going to start? Uh, Northern New Jersey. Northern New Jersey? Yeah. And where are you from, bro? Uh, Bucks County, PA. And are you religious Jew? How, how, like, well, let's talk about this a little bit, because maybe one of you can explain, like, religion, culture, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, I'm Reformed, which means I'm probably the least religious on the scale of um, the three, like, scales of mm-hmm. Judaism. Reformed, which mm-hmm. means what? Do you ever go to, to Shabbat, for example? So do you, I, your parents drag you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was bat mitzvahed, and I went to Hebrew school like 12 years of my life. Wait, bat mitzvahed. Can you yeah. explain what that is? <laughs> um, a bat mitzvah, for anybody who doesn't know, is a celebration of you becoming a man or a woman in the uh, Jewish community. Um, for girls, it's 12 years old. For boy, men, it's 13. And um, you typically, it's your first time reading from the Torah, so it's like a really big deal. And you have to chant the whole thing, and you have to do additional prayers. I did all the prayers by myself, and then you have like a big party afterwards. So it's kind of like for Christians, it's like being christened or yeah, something, like, kind of like confirmation that. kind of thing. Yeah. Bro, how about you? Are you? Um, so I was reformed for a little bit and then conservative for a little bit, which is, I mean, conservative is kind of like more in the middle, kind of depends on like your, your family. But I was like more reformed, like went to the Hebrew school every Wednesday and Sunday, kind of like people go to CCD, had my bar mitzvah, all that type of stuff. Only we go to like synagogue on holidays, otherwise not really. So is your family? Do you guys have, what do you do on holidays? 
Um, so like on the important holidays, like Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, we like go to synagogue, go to services. On all the ones, we just like have a dinner for like Hanukkah or Passover, and like the family just get together. And what do you do at the services? At the synagogue? I mean, because no, because most of the class has no idea. They've never. What do you do? What do you all do? I mean, I'm, I haven't been to church, but I'm pretty sure it's like the same thing, just in some most. Well, a good amount of it's in English. There's something like English, like prayers and like type poems type stuff, and then a lot of it's in Hebrew. You sing a little bit. Sometimes at the end, like you drink wine, eat food afterwards. And you recite from the Torah. Um, certain people recite from the Torah each time. Mm-hmm. I only did for like my bar mitzvah. Uh huh. How do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, it's pretty um, correct. Uh, usually, it's like a member of the like a senior member of the congregation who does a Torah portion. Um, every like high holiday, so Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, you um, have certain members of the congregation come up and like do a tour portion like my dad always did a tour portion um but yeah do your parents go to synagogue every week no so actually my mom is catholic and my uh-huh. dad is jewish so i'm not but i was converted at birth so um they don't go to synagogue every week we go for the holidays and that's uh-huh. pretty much it so really reform mm-hmm. yeah. bro um next question so when do you when is when are services um so there's actually services every Friday night and Saturday morning for those who go. Friday night and Saturday morning? So you go twice? No, I don't. But, but if you were really Jewish. If I was really Jewish, yeah, I'd go Friday night and Saturday morning. All right, got you. All right, so you go, so you go twice. So how do, you mani- how do you manage that up here at like, Penn State? Like, how- well, you don't go, probably, right? Because you're out partying, but... <laughs> Um, so recently, I was never, I never really started going to Shabbat till this year because I went to Israel for two months over the summer, and I really like got more in touch with like being Jewish, and it was like kind of cool. We always had Shabbat dinner, like we always, we were more, even like if you were more um, reformed, like you came from more more reformed background, we all found ourselves kind of celebrating it. Um, and so this year, I've started going to like Chabad or like Aish Hillel. There's a couple of organizations on campus that offer services for students, and they do dinner and like. It's kind of more of a community thing. Like, I don't go there to recite Hebrew. I go there to, like, hang out with my friends and, like, eat food. And So can people who are not Jewish go? Yeah. Um, For sure. And so the, so the celebration begins on Fridays at sundown. You know? Yes. And yes. What, what does that mean? What do you mean? I mean, like, so Fridays at sundown, right? So that means if you were really... Or if you were Orthodox, like you were really like grabbing on, what would that mean? Um, so if you were Orthodox, like that means you would like stop using electronics, like you'd go to services, you'd spend time with your family, you wouldn't use a car, like all the type of, it's like from Friday at sundown till Saturday at sundown, like that's like your, that's your day for holiness, that's what you just, that day of the week is, you know. So for you, so for you all as, and being more reformed, more liberal in that way, or, and, and you're young, right, so who knows, that could change. Um, cause it changes for people. They like have experiences. Uh, but you, but you know, you're living in a Christian world where services are on Sunday. So you really, if you're Jewish, you're really adjusting, right? It's Friday night at sundown to Saturday night at sundown. And you, you know, you really adjust to a different world. And I didn't, I experienced that the, when I, I've been to, Israel twice, and I was in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, it didn't, I didn't even really notice it, but in Jerusalem, my whole life changed, because I'm like, oh my God, and for the first time, I really started to understand what it, I understood what it would be like to be Jewish in the United States, when my holidays, my service, my holy day, does not blend and mesh with. Yeah, I was was, um, also in Israel over the summer, and I was in Jerusalem on a Saturday, and there was like, maybe a car in the road every every 10 minutes like everything nothing was going on uh-huh yeah even in like in tel aviv um yeah well, like there are places open but the buses don't run from five o'clock friday to six o'clock on saturday night typically and in the summer the hours are longer but that's a real like there's a lot of debate they're on a mayoral election right now that's like a lot of the debate like should we keep the buses running for Mm-hmm. people who are more orthodox because Tel Aviv is more reformed but in Jerusalem there's nothing open so listen quick question tell me in, in, in just a few short sentences what does being Jewish mean to you um, to me personally it just kind of means 
being a little different than everyone else, actually. Mm -hmm. Just because, like, growing up, there wasn't a lot of, like, Jewish kids in my school. And even though, like, I'm, like, I'm white and I look, like, look the same as like, most of my friends, especially after going to Israel, like, I realized, like, I am, like, different just, just because of my religion. Like, I mean, that's not just, reli like, religion. It's, like, kind of more heritage as well. Mm -hmm. um, being Jew Jewish to me is a sense of community. I love that I can go anywhere and play Jewish geography with a Jew and like we know the same people, we went to the same camp, like that's what I've always loved about my religion and it's one of the main reasons I came to Penn State because I knew a lot of my Jewish friends in high school were going to come here so like I was never going to be alone. Mm -hmm. So you, it's really, it's one of the cool things in that that emerges actually out of something that's really rather sad that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But So Saturday. Um, just a quick thing, Where, how, how often, how much have you been talking about it? Um, I mean, I've always been talking about it with my family and like other, other Jewish friends. Um, I mean, it's, it's terrible. Like it makes me angry. It makes me sick. But like, honestly, like it's, it wasn't when I read it, like I wasn't like overwhelmingly shocked. I was just kind of like, that's kind of where we are. Mm -hmm. So I spent all day in my classes talking about it yesterday because I had my discussion group and then I'm a journalism major so in my ethics class we had to talk about it because it was news at the end of the day and then I went to the vigil last night on Old Main so it hasn't stopped. Yeah. It's not like we haven't stopped talking about it and my friends and I and my mom and like just everyone in my circle so I'm kind of like, I said to my mom last night, I'm like, I'm emotionally drained from today. Like, I can't talk about this any, like, I, I, I can't stop talking about it, but I also, like, this is so unreal. Yeah. Okay, so what I, what I want to do, I'm going to talk about how, what happened, like, the roots of this, okay? Because I think it's really important that people understand the roots of it. And I think most people don't. So thanks, man. Thanks for coming up. Appreciate it. Yep, thanks, Doug. So, um, so when you think about, now I'm going to speak to Christians for a second. What images or feelings do you have when you think about being Christian? Or about Christianity? Worshipping? All the things that go along with being Christian. Just have some images. What images do you have? Maybe some of these stand out. Here are people in a church praying. Jeez, that's what happens in a Christian church, by the way. Here's a church of nice. Maybe it's this. People singing, people being joyful, people being look, really just loving. Look at look at look at her face. Look at their face. They're happy, they're loving. Look at this guy. He's really thoughtful. He's you know. So when I think about my Christian upbringing, this is the kind of stuff that I think about that I imagine, that I envision. Maybe this. Maybe this. Okay, so. I'm going to give you first just a quick two-minute history. The importance of Judaism in Christian history, okay? First, Christians, before I start, this is not, today's class is not an attack on Christianity by any stretch. Because your church might look like the images that I had up there. That might be your entire experience with Christianity. But it is not necessarily the experience of all people throughout most of history. So here, Jesus was Jewish. 
At the time that Jesus was born, I know you know this, but you got to think about it sociologically. At the time that Jesus was born, there were many people prophesizing about the new Messiah coming. Something is going to happen. The Jewish people, the Jewish writings, and Jews are people of the book. The first time in this way that we see people building a religion, not just around critical thinking, but around argumentation. And the idea that the Messiah is coming again. And there were lots of Messiahs that were rising up. Hey, this person's the Messiah over here, or that one is there. Some people thought that that person over there, and this one in this community, and all sorts of things. If you're Christian, you have the idea that, well, but they weren't the real Messiah because they didn't come from God. But God finally sent Jesus. But God sent a Messiah. If so, God sent a Messiah who was born Jewish and lived as a Jew and died as a Jew. And when he died, somebody killed him. He didn't just die, he was murdered. And someone murdered him. And the Romans murdered him. But somewhere along the way, in the telling of the story that is that has become the New Testament, there are lots of ways you can tell that story. It can be the Romans, but it could also be, hey, hang on a minute. What happened to the, all those other people that were never convinced that Jesus was the Messiah? They remained Jewish. And they never walked over the line to say, yes, we're going to follow God in this incarnation in the form of Jesus, who in the beginning was never a Christian, by the way. It was the Messiah who is sent by God as a Jew to bring a new covenant to the people of the earth. But over time, there were multiple messages that started to emerge. It's like, was it Pontius Pilate? Was it the Romans that killed Jesus? Or was it the Jews who turned their back on Jesus? And at some point in time, we start to see the writings emerge where it wasn't Pontius Pilate, it wasn't the Romans, it was the Jews who killed Jesus. It was Jews who turned their backs on Jesus. Had the Jews followed, Jesus wouldn't have died. But the Jews did that, and that became a story. And that is a story that got woven in lots of different versions of what later became the Old Testament. And over time, that story is woven in in lots of different ways. And I'm going to tell you that it may not be the story that you readily find in the Bible that you use. But it is in many versions of the Bible, and historically it got put in there, and in many versions it still is, and people still use it. And maybe they don't in your church, and maybe you've never met a pastor or a minister or a priest in your life who declares that Jews killed Jesus. But I can assure you that over human history, many, many, many Christians have told the story in that way. It was not the Romans, it was Jews. And as a result, over time, there's been a lot of hatred against Jewish people on the part of Christians. Enmity, fear, loathing, hate. And Jews then became and I say this with all due respect to all the other groups, probably, in my humble opinion, and I'm not a scholar on Jewish history, but I am a scholar on conflict, and I can say that Jews became what are probably the single most persecuted people in the history of humanity. The vast, vast, vast majority of it perpetrated by other Christians. Why? Because Jews committed deicide. Deicide is killing of God. And again, that may not be the story in your church, and that's lovely, but your church is not the center of Christian life and Christian thinking. You've got to go back 
centuries upon centuries. Go back to the starting in the third, the fourth century when we really start to see the writings emerge. So we got 1700 years and you got Christian churches and people preaching and people teaching all over the world. And maybe you haven't encountered them, but I have. I have encountered them all over the place. And then I'm going to introduce you to some. So here, let me just read you one right here. You all seen this little green Bible here that the Gideons hand out? Let me read from John 8. And so this is Jesus speaking to Jews. Starting in 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is, be- is it because it is because you cannot bear to hear my word. And then he says, you are of your father, the devil. He's speaking to Jews. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. That's pretty powerful. Dude, I can interpret that here. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. And so therefore, so are you. Now look, that's in here. There are a lot of things in here. And Jesus has, there are all sorts of loving passages in here. This is an awesome little book. It's cool. It's beautiful. So Christians, is it not, do you not, did you not, how many of you already read from your, your New Testament today? How many will read before you go to bed tonight? It's a beautiful book. But that passage right there, if you already have some enmity and you already have some hate toward Jewish people, all you got to do is take that passage and you can go really far. God cast the Jews out. And you are of the devil. You are of the devil. It doesn't take much. I can't get there from it. Maybe you can't get there from it, right? Like, it doesn't make sense to you. It doesn't make sense to you. Like, yeah, I I don't interpret it that way. But white nationalists do, my friends. Thousands and millions and tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions throughout history have interpreted that way. And that's one of many passages that can be used to hate Jewish people and has been used. Okay? Are we good? You got it. So it doesn't mean you do it. It doesn't mean you think about it, but other people do. So here. And let me give you one of those people. So how many of you are Protestant? How many of you are Christians, but you're not Catholics? Raise your hands. So Christians who are not Catholic, you... You owe, you're, you're this belief that Jesus, those of you who have a belief that Jesus is your personal savior, and it is through Jesus and through accepting him and him forgiving your sins and that personal relationship you have with Jesus, that's all because of this guy right here, Martin Luther, the founder of the Lutheran church, the actual founder, the cause of the schism in the Catholic church that created Protestantism. And in 1519, he wrote the absurd theologians defend hatred for the Jews. Already, he's talking about the extreme hatred that Christians have for Jewish people. What Jew would consent to enter our ranks when he sees the enmity, the, or the cruelty and enmity we wreck on them? That we, our behavior towards them is less, less resemble Christians than beasts. And here. So, he, you know, he said... At this one point, I had this thing. He said, if I had been a Jew and had seen such dolts and blockheads, this is Luther talking, and who govern and teach the Christian faith, I would sooner have become a hog than become a Christian. They have dealt with the Jews as if they were dogs rather than human beings. So this is a guy, Martin Luther, Martin Luther who said, and this is how it started, He's put his 95 treatises on the wall of a church. 
in Wittenberg, Germany. Boom. Pounded them up there. And the treatises basically said the Catholic Church has become a corrupt institution. The Catholic Church, by selling indulgences in the way that it does and all the other things that it does, has become corrupt because what the Catholic Church has said, and he was Catholic, that the only way to get through God is through me, or is through the Catholic Church. And what he said is, no, actually, the way you can get through God is a personal relationship with God. And this starts Protestantism. Okay, you got it. You see this. So here, 20 years later, he writes another book. It's called The Jews and Their Lies. And this is a book that was par for the day. This was not extreme. This was thinking of many, many people of the day. Remember, deicide. I'm, I'm, what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to show you the depth, the roots of the anti-Jewish sentiments as they exist or grew out of Christianity. And so here's what Martin Luther says. They're nothing but thieves and robbers. He changes his mind. Does a 180. Who daily eat no morsel and wear no thread of clothing, which they have not stolen from us. And I speak to you, dear princes and lords, because he's speaking to the aristocracy who have Jews under you or command so that you can get rid of the unbearable devilish burden of Jews. What shall Christians do with this rejected and condemned people? First set fire to their synagogues. Bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn so that nobody will ever have to see them again. Second, destroy their homes. Third, all their prayer books should be burned and destroyed. Four, all their rabbis should be forbidden to teach. Five, all safe conduct on highways should end. That usury, six, usury should be prohibited and all cash should be prohibited, right? And all of it should be, to all the cash and the gold and the silver that Jews own should be taken from them and set aside for safe keeping. This is the father of Protestantism. If you're Baptist, if you're Methodist, if you're Presbyterian, if you're non-denominational, this is the person that started it for you. And seventh, I command putting a flail, an axe, a hoe, a spade, a distaff, or a spindle into the hands of young, strong Jews and Jewesses and letting them earn their bread by the sweat of their brow. Wow, that's intense. So now you have a long, long history. Check this out. Let's go forward 350, 400 years. Martin Luther's German. Now we have Nazism. And you want to know something about all these people? So this is a Nazi rally. I think it's in Nuremberg. Millions of people. Millions of people. Want to know something about them? What do you, what's something that really jumps out for them? Every one of them is a Christian. Everyone is a Christian, my friends. Nazi Germany, everything that happened, everything that was done in Nazi Germany against Jews and against others was done by Christians. So the first thing to start with is never look at other people and other religious groups and think to yourself that my people, Christians, would never ever do that. Christians carried out the most horrific genocide in the history of humanity in just a few short years. Now, you might say, ah, oh, but they weren't really Christians. Really? Really? Of course they were. If they weren't really Christians, then all the other people committing the crimes against people like Muslims and so on, well, then they're not really Muslims or whatever either. Hindus. Of course they're Christians. And what happened was they got caught up in the fever of hate. 
the fever of hate that was born of many, many generations and centuries of hate and writing and talk about Jews, the evil, insufferable Jews who killed Jesus and the history of just treating Jewish people in such horrible ways that it didn't take a lot for these people to come together and allow it to happen and to carry it out. And so you might say, well, but, you know, Hitler... Hitler connected Nazism as a Christian movement. And you can say, nah, but they weren't really Christians. He wasn't, of course, I would say that. Of course I would say that. Are you kidding me? You can't behave that way and in any way call yourself a Christian. At the same time, you can't take tens of millions of people behaving in a certain way and make the proclamation that they are poor followers of their faith. Because if they're poor followers of their faith, then so must be the rest of us in all sorts of ways. It is a slippery slope. Here, we tolerate no one in our ranks who attacks the ideas of Christianity. In fact, our movement is a Christian movement. And here he is with church fathers. So it's like, so now, let's go back. White nationalism. Most every one of these people identify as Christians. When we go back to the Charlottesville rally, they're Christians. This guy in Pittsburgh the other day identifies as a Christian. Now, I can say, but he's not a Christian. He's not a Christian. No, but how do you take Christian philosophy, Christian ideology, the love of Jesus that I can find in here? I can find all sorts of passages about Christ saying, love your enemies, love your neighbors, love everybody, treat people with kind. There are so many passages in here. Where do you get the passages that, that allow millions of people to turn against Jewish people, they're also in here. And people use them, and they have used them, and they've committed some of the most heinous crimes in human history as a result of it. Man, so I want to show you something. So, um, I, I didn't use, to, I, at some point in time I stopped showing, talking about, or, or showing footage from the Holocaust. And I stopped it because it just seemed like it was old and everybody had seen it and, you know, you kind of get tired and you watch footage from the Holocaust and whether it's Auschwitz or Dachau or any one of the other camps and ah, just one after another. So I just kind of stopped. But then what happened was a few years ago, I started talking to more and more students who had never really seen any of the footage and they didn't really know. And they didn't really have an idea of the implications of that. And so, you know, for them, you know, to see a swastika somewhere or to see these guys, you know, with their salute or holding a Nazi flag or a swastika and a flag, it, just, it doesn't really strike them as really particularly troubling because they don't really understand what happened in Nazi Germany if it was caused by and carried out by average, ordinary people who also identified as Christians. So I'm going to show you some footage from Dachau. And it's a trigger warning of sorts because it's really disturbing. But
the white nationalist folks, they identify with Christian ideology. This is a Christian mission. They're not my Christians. They're not the people I grew up with. They're not the people that went to my church. Maybe some of them converted over, the people that went to my church, but I don't know them. They're not the Christians I hang out with. They're not the Christians that I worship with. They're not those Christians. But listen, there are Christians all over who hold on to this ideology. It is not going away. Imagine the kind of hate to do that to another people. Imagine the kind of hate. And then we have this idea that, well, but we in the United States, we were different because, you know, we did something. We helped out. No, actually, one of the reasons that it happened, that it was allowed to happen, is because the world turned away from it. In particular, the Christian world turned away from Nazi Germany and the Holocaust and everything that was happening. Why? Because of the hatred, dislike, and fear of Jews. It wasn't just Germans. It's was it's a it's a plague or was has been a plague in all of Christian thinking. So when Jews then are attacked, when Jews are killed, massacred, genocided, it's easier to turn your back when you've lived in a world of mistrust and hate. So it makes me wonder how many of us would turn our backs on other people who might be at the, at the, the violent end of other actions. Think about just in your heart, how do you think about the people coming up from Mexico? How do you think about them? Do you think about it with compassion or do you think about it with fear and disgust? Do you hate them for coming? And if that's the case, then it's really not that difficult to just walk over here and when somebody else does this to them, to just turn your back and not care. So this is the SS St. Louis. This in 1939 came to the United States. Everything was well underway. It was pretty, we had a pretty good idea of what the Nazis were up to and what was happening and the final solution hadn't kicked in by any stretch. But, you know, they traveled to Cuba and off the coast of Florida and, you know, we wouldn't let them land. And the, there were over 900 Jewish refugees fleeing persecution, fleeing almost certain death. We, the U.S. even shot a cannon across the bow of that ship filled with Jewish refugees so that it would not land in the United States in Florida. So we weren't opening our arms to Jewish peoples. Why? Because largely we're a Christian nation. And we were listening. This guy had 30 million listeners on his radio program. He's a Catholic priest in the 1930s leading up to Nazi Germany. When, and then when he said, and this was after, this is what he said afterwards. When we get through with the Jews in America, they'll think the treatment they received in Germany was nothing. Oh my God, 30 million listeners. That's what he's saying. You'd think 30 million people would just tune out. Oh, you're talking about Jewish people like that? Come on, man, I'm not listening to that. There's so much anti-Jewish sentiment, so much anti-Jewish thinking. There has to be. Not only for Nazi Germany, for that Holocaust to happen, but for the rest of the world. Let's just kind of turn a blind eye. Here, core doctrinal teaching of the Catholic Church up until the Second Vatican Council. Take a look at this. Core teaching. Core teaching, Catholics. All the Jews in Palestine around 30 in the Common Era were responsible for the execution of Jesus. All Jews who are currently living are also responsible for Jesus' death. Also, when Hitler just turns around and decides, hey, we're just going to exterminate all the Jews, well, the Jews tried to kill your God. So what, are you going to stand up for them? God has rejected, rejected Jews because they murdered Jesus. Perfidious Jews. Perfidious Jews. So, perfidious Jews was a term that 
Catholics used in their Good Friday services. And perfidious is another word for deceitful. So in every Catholic church, all across the world, on Good Friday, one of the most holy days in the Christian calendar, Jews were referred to as deceitful. Does this man's actions on Saturday start to kind of like, it comes around suddenly, right? It starts to make, oh, wait, hang on. Oh, do you kind of, do you get kind of a sense of why Jewish people might be a little bit afraid? Can you get a sense of that? And especially being around Christians, I'm like, man, if I'm Jewish, I I don't know, like, I'm, I don't, am I going to turn my back on, I, I don't know. Right? Do you, do you see how that might be the case? Oh, here, let's bring it up to the present. Because you might say, well, that was the early 60s, so this doesn't happen anymore. So this guy, let me walk you through him. Remember, that's the past. Now, I needed to find a couple modern-day prophets of anti-Semitism. Prophets of Jewish hatred. It, I, the, 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 it wasn't difficult. To, it's not difficult to find them. It's difficult to, to weed out the ones I just didn't feel like talking about. I chose this guy just because that image was so awesome that I said, okay, let me just use him. Mike Bickle. Anyone hear this guy? Oh, lovely. Okay, so Listen. There are two methods to convert the world's Jewish population to Christianity. Two methods. After discussing the fishermen that will use grace, fishermen use grace to convert the Jews. Because we still have time to save all of you who are Jewish. We're still going to have some time because we're still, you know, our job as Christians is still to convert you and bring you into the fold of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That way you'll get to heaven. So we can use grace. Or, according to Pastor Bickle, we can turn to the hunters. And the hunters use violence to get the same end. So here is his quote. And the Lord says, And if they don't respond to grace, they being Jews... I'm going to raise up the hunters. And the most famous hunter who was sent by God is a man named Adolf Hitler. Wow. So either Jews, you either convert or we'll just kill you. Okay, so now you say, all right, so who is this guy? Because he might, he could just be some guy from the church down the road. You know, you, you see one of these churches on the side of the road in like rural Pennsylvania or whatever. It's got about 12 parishioners and nobody really pays attention to him. Oh, Ted Cruz. You know, this guy, he said this when he was running for president of the United States. He's still a senator. Bickle's one of his famous followers. I'm grateful to Mike's dedication to call a generation of young people to prayer and spiritual commitment and hunting Jews, I guess. Heidi and I, I guess that's his wife, are grateful to have his prayers and support. With the support of Mike and many other people of faith, we will fight the good fight, finish the course, and keep the faith. What's the fight the good fight? Kill Jews? Dudes, Here, can I just tell you how deep anti-Semitism is? This man right here is a senator. He's one of the 100 most powerful men in the United States. When he made this quote, my recollection is he was running for president of the United States. Got it? So he's not far against the highest office. His, one of his ministers, strong supporters who's part of his circle, says, Jews, you either come by grace or we'll just kill you. And nobody, nobody is calling on this guy to resign. Are you kidding me? 
Are you kidding me? This is how deep anti-Semitism is. How is it possible that this guy isn't shamed, shamed into putting his head down, going into a dark room or a cave and never leaving? After the Holocaust, listen, my friends, you saw the images on the Holocaust. You get it, right? Six million Jews, the destruction, the hatred. This guy is basically saying, Adolf Hitler, he was the greatest hunter. Oh my God, we'll just call Adolf Hitler again. Again. Do you see this? If you're Jewish, bro, if, you're, if I'm Jewish, I'm really scared. I'm just really troubled by the fact that Americans would not just be so outraged at just this guy. And he's just one, y'all. Like, okay, here, let me give you another one. How about this guy? He was, he said the opening prayer. It, it, uh, what's his name? Donald Trump. It, Donald Trump's prayer breakfast, and his inaugural day prayer breakfast. He's got a mega church in Dallas. Here's, the, I just want to get, Judaism, you can't be saved being Jewish. I don't know how like this goes with, how it works out with Donald Trump's son-in-law and his daughter who converted to Judaism and Donald Trump's two grandkids who are Jewish. But this guy says, no, nah, you can't be saved being Jewish. You're going to hell if you're Jewish. The three greatest Jews in the New Testament were Peter, Paul, and Jesus Christ, and they all said Judaism won't do it. It's faith in Jesus Christ. And he also said Hitler was part of God's plan to get Jews to return to Israel. Because in order for, and this is what's scary, in, for me, just humbly speaking, for me, in order for the prophecies, the New Testament prophecies, to play themselves out, for Jesus to come again, Israel has to be built up. All the Jews have to go back to Israel and it has to be a strong nation. And this is part of this whole movement of many of these fundamentalists like this guy to support Israel, even though Jews aren't going to get to heaven. So here's what I want to say. This is not an attack on Christianity. Christians, if you feel attacked, you didn't hear, you're not hearing my message. I'm not saying it's you. And I'm not saying it's your minister or your pastor or your priest who's teaching these teachings about Jewish people. Who's, you may have never heard in your life. May, you may have never ever heard that Jews killed Jesus. It's entirely possible that you've never heard that. But millions upon millions upon millions of people continue to teach that. And then the hatred goes out toward Jewish people. And the guy in Pittsburgh has heard that over and over and over again because that's just a mantra of the white nationalists. And part of the reason that I teach, hang on, this is going to be my last statement because I want to say something personal here, actually. I didn't grow up hating Jewish people. I grew up hearing this idea that the Jews killed Jesus. But in my mind, I was able to make the connection to say, eh, eh whatever. So whoever, somebody killed Jesus, I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me. It didn't matter to me. But I grew up with the distrust of Jewish people that I heard all around me, that somehow Jewish people were doing something mischievous. They were doing something, I don't know, something's happening that they can't be trusted. They, that goes on today. And one of the reasons I teach is because I'm deeply concerned about the fact that we don't think, we don't put 
these juxtaposed ideas together, like the ones I'm putting together today. And if we don't, then we're doomed to repeat the deeds and the sins of the past, because that's what happens. And so for those of you who are Christians and walk around with love in your heart, spread that love, my friends, because there are other people out there who also proclaim to be Christians and neither you nor I would accept, would argue that they are, but they have a very different perspective. And this movement, this white nationalist movement is not going away. All right. See you. Thanks, man.